this guy's stuff. Hey guys, adjust this a little bit. I'm here, Andy. We're also live on Instagram, so trying to get multiple things going here. All right, well, Welcome to our Bass on the Fly clinic. I'm supposed to do this in the shop, but we're not allowed to do that right now. Hi, Lee. Um, so let's see how many. We have eight people. All right, well, let's get started. Um, I'm going to start with why would you want to fish for Bass on the Fly? Well, first of all, it's really fun. Um, it's one of my favorite ways to fish, um, or fish to fish for. Um, they eat on the surface, they jump. It's a good thing to do when other things aren't as good, like during runoff. Springtime is you know, probably the best time for bass fishing. Into the summer, um, you know, don't have to worry about water levels and clarity and all that stuff. So. Uh, it's a good thing to do when other things might not be an option for you, you know, whether it's rain in the summer or runoff or whatever's going on. Um, so here in our area and, you know, in the United States, we have, you know, two species of bass that we really fish for, smallmouth, largemouth. Um, our most, I'd say probably prevalent species is smallmouth here, um, especially in our bigger reservoirs, Biocito, Navajo, McPhee. Um, or predominantly smallmouth fisheries. When it comes to bass, uh, they get up to about five pounds in our area. There might be some bigger fish too, but you know, generally most of the fish are going to be kind of in that two to three pound range with four pounder being pretty big. Um, you know, they're in kind of more rocky areas. So Navajo is a great place with all that sandstone. They really like a lot of those rocky shorelines there. Um, they like cooler water than a largemouth does. So you know, they generally fish earlier and, you know, but in summertime, they may go a little deeper just to get more of that cool water um, refuge. Uh, largemouth, uh, we do have a fair number of largemouth. We actually have a state record, which is in our area. Um, we're by Pagosa from a small lake over there. Uh, there's That fish was 10 pounds and change. So there's some pretty big largemouth in our area. Um, there's a few in Navajo as well, definitely not as many as the smallmouth. Uh, there's some in Totten, a lot of little ponds, farm ponds have them. Uh, there are some of other public places that have them as well. Um, you know, they're usually warmer water, so more in the summertime, later in the spring. Uh, they like more woody debris, weedy areas than, you know, the hard structure, hard rock bottom that smallmouth like. Um, they like deep top water, so that can be pretty fun to do that as well. Um, sorry, I'm reading comments over there. Um, what's up, everybody? Just joining in. What's up, Justin? Hi, Ryan. What's going on? Oh, Joe Genualdi. Shouldn't you be saving the world, Joe? Um, so, you know, as far as where in our area, um, you know, Navajo is probably our best bass fishery, or at least most consistent. Um, got some great smallmouth fishing there, uh, but you really need a boat. Uh, hard to fish that one without a boat. Uh, there's a few spots you can get to, but for the most part, it's those steeper rocky shorelines that are really difficult to fish from shore. Uh, Baicito has maybe not quite as many. You're not going to put up as many numbers as Navajo, but they have some really big ones there. Um, a little easier to fish from shore. There's plenty of places to wade fish around that lake, uh, stumps and rocky shorelines. Um, and points there too, if it's windy on the rocky points, they'll get on there at Biocito. Um, Echo has largemouth. Um, that's where state records out of. There's those big fish in there are really hard to catch. They get a lot of pressure, especially during the spawn. But uh, 
there's plenty of, you know, medium to smaller fish in there that like to eat poppers and are fairly easy to catch. Um, pretty fun. Easy enough to get around in there. You can put a boat in it. One of the few smaller lakes you can has still has an open boat ramp as well. Um, Morgan Lake is another one that you don't hear of a lot. Sound South Farmington, it's a power plant lake. Um, so it fishes earlier in the season than a lot of other lakes do because that discharge from the power plant is warm. So more through the winter, those fish can you know feed pretty well. So that's something interesting to do in the early spring and even winter time sometimes. Um, there was a fish kill there if you go back uh, probably eight or ten years ago now, but uh, those fish have recovered pretty well and there's some, starting to be some pretty good sized ones in there again. Then you also have, you know, the other assorted smaller state wildlife areas, Pewitt, Totten, McPhee is a bigger reservoir, um, high numbers of fish in there, but mostly smaller ones, uh, local farm ponds and ponds in your subdivision, all those places have bass in them. So it makes it nice and easy to kind of go, you know, not so far out of the way sometimes to go do some bass fishing easy without having to drive somewhere to go to a river and you know, get all geared up. You can stop and fish for a little bit and you know, hopefully catch some fish out of those smaller ponds. So gear you'll need for bass fishing. Um, a fast action six or seven weight is probably the best rod out there to fish. Uh, maybe an eight if you're fishing for really big fish or, you know, really targeting super big bass with big flies. Um, places that you know, have stalker rainbows that they eat stuff. You might need an eight weight just to throw the fly. Um, the sage payloads meant to throw big warm water flies, style flies that are, you know, wind resistant and tough to cast. So that's a good one that just came out. We have a couple of those here at the shop. Uh, the X seven weights, probably one of the best bass rods there is. Uh, the sector from Scott in the six and seven. Then even the, you know, in the more mid price points up, the foundation or flex, uh, foundations, a sage rod, flex is a sky rod. Both of those, you know, are fast enough to handle throwing some big flies in the wind. Uh, and, you know, even a little cheaper than those is the Reddington Predator. Um, that would be a good option. You know, if you're looking for more of a budget six or seven weight. And, you know, six or seven, definitely useful trout fishing too. So it doesn't have to be just a, one uh one dimensional tool uh reels you know you don't need anything crazy for bass most 95 percent of the fish you're going to catch you won't get on the reel 10 car bass yeah cane pole uh so you know just a large arbor reel that can pick up line quick if you need to um you know if you're serious about it Get another spool for your reel um, so you can have multiple line options just because different scenarios. You're going to use different lines and different, you know, techniques. So you might need a different type of fly line on there. And the other option is, you know, to have, you know, more than one rod rigged up, especially if you're in a boat. But a lot of times just having an extra spool is a little cheaper option. So we continue. So lines, uh, fly lines are key to kind of the bass fishing, having a line that is designed to throw those bigger flies, heavier flies, and do what you need it to do. Uh, I've got a few options here. So probably 80% of the time, maybe even more than that, I'm throwing just a floating line um, for a number of reasons that I'll go over here in a minute, but some good options. Uh, this is the Rio Big Nasty, designed to throw you know very wind resistant flies. Um, show you guys over here too. It's an overweighted line and you know, you're not usually throwing really far to bass. It's more about accuracy, throwing the cover in a specific spot and, you know, throwing, delivering that big fly where you need it to go. MPX amplitude. It's another good line. Pretty aggressive as well. Half line weight heavy, help you load those rods, faster action rods at shorter distances. And you know, turn those big flies over. Uh, Real gold is another good option for that, similar to the MPX. Uh, not quite as aggressive as the uh, big nasty. And then you know, for a sinking option, generally you're not fishing more than 20 feet down, even for a smallmouth. 
So I want something that's gonna like this, uh, 24 foot sink tip from Rio. SA makes a similar line, 25 foot sink, sink tip and sonar. Uh, that's a, these come in grains. So this is gonna be like a 150 is like a five or six weight. Then you go up to like a 200 for a seven weight. Um, that'll get you down four to five inches per second. But mostly what's gonna help get you down is the weight of the fly versus, you know, using that fly line to help get down. But 20 feet, you need a little bit of help from the fly line. You can also use one of those versileaters on the end of your uh, floating line if you just want to help it get down a little bit more. Um, why floating lines most of the time? Uh, you can see the strikes. So a lot of times, especially a small mouth, is going to eat the fly as it falls. So in between strips, you're stopping the fly, it's falling, that fish picks it up and you know may spit it out before you ever see it but he a lot of times he's going to grab it and start going back down to his little hole under a rock or back to his stump and you're going to see that where that fly line goes underwater right at the tip you might see it move or do something different than just fall straight down and that way you can see that that fish has picked your fly up and then make a strip set from there uh, it's versatile you can fish subsurface you can if you need to Conditions change, all of a sudden now they're eating on top. You can throw a floating fly, you know, a top water fly on and have that versatility. Um, but really it's that, you know, way they eat it on the drop, that, that floating line really allows you to see those strikes. Uh, leaders. So if you're fishing poppers, uh, top half of the water column, you know, less than five feet down, uh, standard tapered leader will work just fine we sell these bass leaders here usually i'm fishing somewhere between 12 and 16 pound on the leader uh, nine feet plenty um, if you want to add tippet to it just to have some fluoro because it's a little more invisible uh this real fluoro flex warm water is great for that it's a little stiffer than your standard trout fluoro so you know fishing in those warmer water conditions it'll keep its stiffness versus starting to wilt and not turn over as much. You know, you can, it's really abrasion resistant. So if they run through the brush or run through the rocks, that stuff holds up pretty good. So, especially for monofilament. So the level leader is another thing I fish a lot for bass, uh, especially if I'm fishing really heavy and trying to fish where like small mouth around rocks, I'm trying to get the fly to drop straight down into a spot from where it hits and get that fly to sink really fast and they, that's when they're eating it on the drop. And so a level leader of somewhere between 10 to 20 pound fluoro or maxima. Um, it's about the diameter really more than the break strength. So the thinner it is, the faster it's gonna sink. The deeper I'm gonna fish, the longer and thinner you're gonna wanna be um, to get that fly to sink effectively down to the depth that those fish are at. You know, you see a spot on the surface and you need it to cast it there and then drop straight down to the fish. Um, so I'm fishing anywhere from eight to 12 feet of leader on that with a level leader. And that's just tying a perfection loop, looping on the fly line and straight to the fly, one section. Um, usually 12 pounds about where I'm fishing when I'm fishing that kind of rig. And that's when I'm fishing a heavy fly, jig style fly that I want it to get down on the shady side of a rock or a stump or fishing a specific spot that's going to let it swing where, oh, because of the taper of a tapered leader, it sinks at different rates because of the thickness of it. So that's going to swing and maybe not drop straight down into that spot where you want the fly to be. It's going to end up closer to you or farther away from the spot because of that swing. Um... Flies. So we're going to talk a little bit about flies next. Uh, we'll start with topwater poppers. That's what everybody, you know, hopes to go out and do when they go bass fishing. Um, kind of a couple different options here. I'm out of some frog patterns right now, but a big deer hair frog is pretty fun to fish. Uh, this is just your basic bass popper in black. Um, this one's a number six. Just a hard popper. Pretty fun to fish that guy. Uh, 
Then you have what's called like the gurgler style, which is foam tied on top of the hook with this lip here, kind of push it up. And as you strip it, it just spits water. Doesn't make quite as much noise, but maybe a little more subtle than the, you know, big bass popper that makes a big gurgling less sound there. Uh, then you have you know, kind of a deer hair mouse pattern that's going to skitter, skitter on the top. You know, makes most of its noise from spitting versus, you know, a big chug from the popper body on those plastic guys. Those are pretty hard to cast on level leader systems, so you definitely want to have a tapered leader for those big wind-resistant flies on the surface. Uh, frogs are another one that are good. Uh, Dalbert divers, a lot of options out there for um, you know topwater flies. You can even fish hoppers and some of your trout flies, especially in a small pond um, situation where you know big hopper pattern will work great. Uh, Marty just asked, are you using non-slip mono or is there not you like more? Um, bass fishing, almost always using a non-slip mono loop. Uh, just lets that fly articulate a little bit better on there. So then we're going to talk about some unweighted flies. Um, flies that are going to fish, you know, fairly shallow. But if you're, you know, fishing over lead lines or fish are up shallow spawning, um, you need to fish, you know, less than five feet of water. These are, you know, all good options. You can fish them on a sink line down deeper too, uh, but you're not going to get that fall. It's going to fish more, you know, level across the whatever, you know, water column you're fishing in. Um, something like this. This is the Mighty Minnow. Some bucktail and feather, pretty classic style fly. You can imitate a golden shiner or something like that. Uh, low fat minnow we have. It's a fly fish food pattern. Uh, great little fly. That's the sexy shad. Had a lot of luck with that coloration on you know, hardware and flies in our area, especially the smaller lakes like Totten and Pewet and stuff. And then one for Echo or any place that has sunfish is the bluegill color of the low-fat minnow. Great option too. There's the sexy shad. Um, kinky muddler, another, you know, slightly longer bait fish pattern. Moves a lot of water, has some great movement. Um, Good snook fly too, but there's that guy. You got some more flashy, kind of more minnow bait fish patterns, hot flash minnow. It's the anchovy color, macro color, both of those. Good options, especially in dirty water. Um, gonna stand out a little bit more. Classic deceiver. Also a good, you know, pattern there. It's another one I like. I think it's an underrated bass fly. We sell it a lot as a trout fly, but the uh, this is the what's that called? Anyway, forgot the name of that one. But oh, that's the flash fry. That's what it's called. Sorry. Then we're gonna move into more weighted patterns. Uh, crayfish. Uh, especially for smallmouth, they love crayfish because uh, they live down and they like those rocky shorelines and crayfish live down in those spaces between the rocks. You get wind going and current going, those crayfish get churned up and moved around. Um, we've got some newer crayfish patterns here. This one, it's heavy, so it's going to get down fish on the drop really well for smallmouth. This is called the sweet baby craw. Then some smaller crayfish, especially those fish get kind of finicky and picky. These uh, crazy dads, olive and orange, these make good trout flies in lakes as well. So good crossover pattern to have in your box. You can definitely catch plenty of bass on those guys. There's even the uh, son of crazy dad. If there's really small baby crayfish around, they tend to like the smaller crayfish. I think just cause maybe they don't get pinched as much. They're easier to crush digest uh, so sometimes those tiny crayfish you know an inch long kind of size can work really well and back some other weighted clouser minnow probably caught more bass than any fly in the world comes in a lot of different colors and sizes but 
you know what they say, if it, if it ain't chartreuse, it ain't no use. So that's my favorite. Size six, chartreuse and white clouser. Uh, you know, if you got large mouth and are on beds, spawning and protecting their, they, the females will guard their nests. Something that looks like a crayfish or lizard pattern can work pretty well. So these circus peanuts with lots of legs, weighted, uh, articulated kind of trout fly can work pretty good as a bass on when they're on the beds fly too. Um, those lizards and salamanders will try to eat their eggs. So they usually attack those pretty violently if you can get it in the right situation. And then probably another, you know, one of the most popular bass flies out there is the meat whistle it was actually designed by John Barnes bass fly. Um, looks like a jig and pig, something that guys with conventional tackle fish all the time and works very effectively, especially on small mouth in our area, just because it has that fast drop rate sinks and fishes hook up because of the jig. So you don't get stuck in the rocks quite as much. And then another new pattern we have this year, which is actually tied on a poured lead jig, which I fish a lot of these kind of flies that I, I tie myself. Uh, this one's called the dead drop minnow and should be really killer, uh, especially in the summertime when those fish are eating smaller baby perch and more baby minnows that are great color on it. It's the dead drop minnow. Check that guy out. Um, I think jigs, you know, in our area are really effective, uh, especially, you know, the bigger lakes like Navajo and Biocito. You can get it right down on top of that structure that you're trying to fish, especially when combined with a level leader, uh, pretty deadly. I'll show you actually a couple different variations that I tie in colors. Uh, I think on those little jigs, white is definitely big. Um, olive that's a uh, you know olive and copper colored kind of crayfish jig you can see that you know, jig head it's tied on if you are going to tie these 16th or 32nd ounce jig heads you can cast on a six or seven weight anything much heavier than that is gets really awkward to cast on a fly rod uh, white and blue or white and if you have stained water by Cito, I like because it has dirty water and a dark bottom, so I'll fish black, black and purple. And those darker. I was fishing these guys a lot. So this is like the Giza lizard with a furled dubbing loop tail that floats because it's got, got egg yarn in it. Really good. I gotta get in here. Kind of. Plastic worm, looking fly, lots of rubber, furled tail with a rubber tail on there. It's a good large mouth fly. Um, retrieve of the fly is key. Uh, most of the time I start with a long, slow strip and a pause. Um, based on how more pause in between strips as you go farther away out from the shoreline and it gets deeper. Uh, if you're fishing from shore in, then you know, you're know gonna let it sink a ways and then have less of a pause as you move it in so it doesn't get hung up. There's kind of the jerky short strip, but still, you still on that short strip, it's short and hard, but need to have a pause in between to let that fly sink back down to whatever level you're trying to fish. Uh, with poppers or top water, Largemouth typically like to eat it when the fly is stopped. So definitely give it a long pause. And the colder the water is, the longer the pause should be where that fly just sits there. And then with smallmouth, you definitely want to keep it moving and swimming. So where bass keep it moving, you know, nice, long and slow, and just get that fly to like kind of chug along on the surface. Uh, they seem to not really want to eat that fly if it stops for too long in smallmouth. has zig jigs um this is that get wind on them and a wind driven current uh smallmouth will love current generally if there's not a lot of current they're 
pretty picky and hard to catch. Um, but if you get a little bit of wind or current coming in from a river, some way that there's, you know, bringing them food, um, much better than, you know, just calm conditions for smallmouth uh, rocks. They don't really like to be in the sun. So if there's a big rock, they're going to be on the shady side. Um, they'll sometimes get on stumps and woody debris um, as well, especially in Bicedo where there's maybe not, depending on lake level, there might not be big chunky rocks for them to get on. They'll, you know, go onto those stumps. Um, but usually places where there's, you know, some kind of drop off in depth and stuff. They don't really like to be out in the middle of like a open flat. Um, you know, usually about 50 degree water temp is when you're going to start to see those smallmouth become more active. Um, I've caught them maybe as cold as 48, but usually 50 is kind of the limit where I'm really going to start to look for those fish. Um, usually you're going to see them in the spring around places where they can be near some gravel, um, chunk rock mixed with gravel, where more in the summer they may be in just rocks and not really care what the rest of the bottom looks like but they need some kind of smaller gravel around those bigger rocks in the springtime for them to spawn. So generally they're going to eat a little bigger fly in the spring too, before they spawn um, and before all the other fish spawn. Cause once those little fry hatch, like the perch and crappie and all those other little fish all spawn in the spring. So you got a couple months till those little baby fry are born that they will feed on during the summer months as they grow. Um, we're going to go deeper water over about 65 degrees. Usually those bass are going to start to drop down in depth. Um, they can, you know, 15, 20 feet. Uh, if it gets really warm, they'll suspend over open water, 30 feet down, pretty hard to catch them with a fly rod at that point. Uh, but usually we don't see too much of that in our area, you know, water temps that high, especially in the bigger lakes, um, where those small mouth live. So large mouth. They're going to be, you know, more weedy brush pile areas. Um, they don't get sluggish till about 80 degrees. So, you know, anything usually in our area, you're going to have pretty good, you know, success on largemouth as far as water temp goes, maybe in some small lakes if it's really hot. Middle of the day, they might get tough, but, you know, you can always go mornings and evenings and catch those largemouth. Um, the bigger lakes, you know, thing in more back of canyons, areas where there's softer bottom that's not entirely rock. Uh, more kind of transitional versus steep drop off. So, you know, flats and, you know, not as steep bottom kind of stuff is where those small, those large mouths are going to hang out. And usually near some kind of structure, whether it's a weed line or trees or, you know, some kind of structure on that flat is where they're going to hold. Um, that's where more that, you know, you can push that sink tip and swim it across those flats and stuff and get those large mouth or, you know, in the morning and evening, they may move up towards the edges where it's a little shallower and might be able to get them on top too. Um, yeah, that kind of covers most of, you know, our local fishing. Um, bass live just about everywhere you go. So go on a vacation or a trip and want to do some fishing and you're not sure what to do. Uh, check out the local bass pond. I've done that plenty of places all over the country and can always usually find a few bass to catch with the fly rod. Um, and most of this stuff is all pretty universal. Uh, large mouth, small mouth live in every state in the U.S. So you can always go and get those guys. Just got to figure out what their forage might be in whatever lake you're at. And usually that doesn't vary too much. It's small bait fish or crawdads or lizards or, you know, they're pretty generalist as far as, you know, what they can eat and what they will eat. So, you know, look around what's there at the lake when you get there and you always try a popper if you can, and then, you know, go down in depth from there. I always try to fish, you know, from top of the water column to the bottom uh, when I'm looking for bass and start up top and then go deeper and deeper and deeper until you figure out where they are. Any questions from anybody? Got I think I answered all the questions on YouTube. What's up, Seth? What's up, Jacob? Oh, turned it around. All right.
Um, if you got any questions, you can message us on Facebook or Instagram as well. I'll be around most of the day. can answer any further questions you guys might have. Um, bass fishing is starting to heat up already. Uh, got a couple the other day at a smaller lake looking for some pike. Um, I've heard reports of a few fish getting caught at Navajo already. Uh, usually there it's the bigger ones come up early. So usually you catch a few big fish before you start really catching a lot of numbers. Usually guys pick them up while they're pike fishing. So it's about there. Usually April, May is prime time in our area. That's when we'll see a lot of fish in the smaller lakes spawning and up shallow where they're pretty susceptible to catch them with a fly rod. And then, uh, you know, May and yeah, May and June at Navajo is probably prime time. And then by is more like late May through the summer. Uh, it can be pretty good at by Cedo and then even in the fall. So give it a go. If you guys got any questions, give us a ring or look us up on Facebook, Instagram. And yeah, go throw some flies at bass. It's pretty fun. Thanks for stopping in. <laughs>